So yesterday was February 2nd, the Feast of Candle Mass. We had our first snowfall of the season. We got about six to nine inches, and it is really welcome. Today's video, we're looking at the Feast of Candle Mass or the presentation of the Lord. And the question is, what does that have to do with Groundhog's Day and all of this snow? Stick around, we'll get to that in a minute. Wanna give you a quick update on our house. Luckily, the roofers came by and replaced the damaged portion of the roof. They did a great job, it blends right in. You can't even tell the difference. It is cold, cold, cold here. We finally got some snow yesterday, about six to nine inches. Right now, it's warmed up to a balmy zero degrees Fahrenheit. You're watching the Iced Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminary and graduate schools and to bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please be sure to subscribe so you know when I put new material up, and it always helps to give it a thumbs up. Plus, if you leave comments down below, I always enjoy reading them and seeing what you have to think. Today, we're looking at Luke 2, verses 22 through 40, the reading and the lectionary for this week. This is the story of Jesus' presentation in the temple, and I'm going to be reading from the Revised Standard Version today. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the father's child and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed him and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. At that moment, she came in and began praising God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of the Lord was upon him. Now this text is read and observed on February 2nd in the Western Church. Why? Because this falls 40 days after Christmas, which was the prescription in the Old Testament for making these sacrifices. So it naturally falls within the season of Epiphany. The second reason is it's another epiphany type story. Jesus is revealed as the Messiah by the canticle of Simon and the prophetess Anna. They see something in him that no one else does. Now, instead of working through this entire passage, what I would like to do is take sort of a shotgun approach and hit four different aspects of this story. Shotgun point number one. In verses 22 through 24, we're given the reason why Mary and Joseph are taking Jesus into the temple. They are there for the purification and the redemption of Jesus. And immediately we run into a question that has been debated since the early church. Luke combines two Jewish observances into one in this passage. The ritual of purification for Mary after giving birth to a child, and the second for the redemption of the firstborn son from the Lord. 
According to the law, a mother had to present a sacrifice for purification after giving birth, Leviticus chapter 12. Because Mary and Joseph are poor, they offer the minimum sacrifice prescribed in the Old Testament, two turtle doves. The second ritual was to present an offering to the Lord to redeem the firstborn from the Lord. According to the law, the firstborn male child was the property of the Lord, and the families had to present an offering to redeem him from the Lord for them. This is found in Exodus chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, and Exodus 13 verses 11 through 16. The debate surrounding this passage concerns whether Luke got these two Jewish rituals confused, or if he didn't know better, since they are two very different observances in the Old Testament. A large part of the debate focuses on what I call historical preciseness. Historical preciseness is the assumption that we often make that this story must be historically precise to the facts if it is to be true or not. But this confuses the categories of historical facts and narration. If we look at how Luke tells this account, I hope I can show you what I mean. Luke uses an A, B, B prime, and A prime pattern to recall the visit of the family to the temple. Point A is in Luke 22, the first half. And in this section, he mentions the sacrifice for Mary's purification. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses. Point B occurs in the second half of verse 22. Now Luke shifts to the redemption of Israel. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Then B prime comes in verse 23. Luke sticks with the theme of Jesus' redemption in the second half. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And then finally he returns to Mary's purification, point A prime in verse 24. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Notice how Luke carefully has woven these two stories into one narrative unit. His goal is not to show historical precision, but to show that Jesus' family carefully observed the Jewish religion. Shotgun point number two. How did we come to observe Jesus' presentation in the temple on February 2nd, or the Sunday after that? The early church observed and remembered Jesus' presentation in the temple and Simeon and Anna's encounter with the infant in what is called the Feast of Hypante. Now we have numerous sermons from the early church that record their observance of this feast. These include Bishop Methodius of Patra in 312 AD, Cyril of Jerusalem preached on this feast in 360, Gregory the theologian followed him in 390, and then Gregory of Nicaea and John Chrysostom also preached on this feast around 400 AD. However, the most significant name in the observance of this feast is that of Ezuria. Now, I looked at her pilgrimage to Jerusalem and the spread of the practice of Palm Sunday to the Western Church last year during Lent. And I'll have a link to that video above here and also in the show more section under this video, depending on how YouTube is operating on your platform. The name of that video was Palm Sunday in COVID Lockdown, The Ancient Church to the Rescue. And as I said, I'll have the link underneath if you're interested in seeing that. And just as a side note, it's really hard to come to terms with COVID and its lasting impact on our culture for over the past year and a half, or that almost a million lives have been lost to this disease in the United States alone. We are truly humbled by something so small we can't even see it with our naked eyes. And once again, I think this calls us to recognize how dependent we are upon God. We like to think that we have control over our lives, but something like this should remind us of our dependence upon Him for our daily lives. As the Lord's Prayer reminds us, give us our daily bread. But I digress. Ezria recounted in her pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the 380s AD, she recounts that on the 14th of February, the church would make a solemn procession to the Basilica where a sermon was preached on Luke 22 by the bishop. Ezria writes, The 14th day after Epiphany is undoubtedly celebrated here with the very highest honor. For on that day there is a procession in which all take part. 
in the Anastasis. And all things are done in their order with the greatest joy, just as at Easter. All the priests, and after them the bishop, preach, always taking for their subject that part of the gospel where Joseph and Mary brought the Lord into the temple on the 40th day. And Simeon and Anna the prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, saw him, treating the words which they spoke when they saw the Lord and that offering which his parents made. And when everything that is customary had been done in order, the sacrament is celebrated and the dismissal takes place. Isn't it remarkable to have accounts like this preserved for us even down to this day? By 500 AD, this feast was established on February 2nd throughout most of the Western Church. The Feast of the Presentation is also known as Candle Mass because of the practice of lighting candles during the service. This idea is taken from Simeon's proclamation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, in verse 232. Shotgun point number three. What is the link between Candle Mass and Groundhog Day? And just on a side note, that's a great movie as well. Groundhog Day is a North American tradition if you're from some other place in the world. It derives from the idea that if a groundhog sees its shadow on February 2nd, it'll retreat back into its den. This is then taken as a sign that we are in for six more weeks of winter weather. It's best known for its celebration or observance in Puxit County, Pennsylvania, where they take groundhog Phil and place it on the ground to see if he sees his shadow. Some think that this was brought over from German settlers who may have had a similar folklore about either badgers, foxes, or bears. However, behind it all appears to stand an old Christian superstition that if we have good weather on candle mass, then we are in for six more weeks of severe winter weather. An old English limerick preserves this tradition. If candle mass day is clear and bright, winter will have another bite. If Candlemas brings cloud and rain, winter is gone and will not come again. So I guess our snowstorm on the Feast of Presentation is a good sign if you're looking for spring to come soon. This brings me to shotgun point number four, Simeon and Anna. Now Simeon and Anna are often portrayed together through the ages in various depictions of the story and artwork. And also within the Gospel of Luke, it's worth noting that Luke often portrays male and female characters cooperating together in the spread of the Gospel. Both Simeon and Anna are presented as prophets here. The most intriguing part of this story is the Song of Simeon, also known as the Nuke Dimittis, 2, 29-32. This comes from the Latin words that are actually in the text there, Nuke Dimittis, and it means you may now dismiss or now dismiss. When Simeon sees Jesus, his speech centers on the very end of Luke's gospel, that Jesus will provide salvation for the Gentiles. But for Mary, he issues a very strong and serious warning. A sword will pierce your soul. By doing so, Mary's role is transformed from not just being Jesus' mother, but a challenge to her being a faithful disciple as well here at the very beginning of the gospel. In all of these instances, Luke is very careful to make us notice that God is working through Jesus, and this is testified to by the Holy Spirit's work in the lives of those around him. Both Simeon and Anna perceive something in this baby that others don't. They have an epiphany. They get a glimpse into the broader horizon for which this child is destined. The way that Luke tells this story, Jesus' parents stand amazed. I guess that got the dogs a little excited as well. The way that Luke tells this story, Jesus' parents stand amazed. What they are hearing will take over 30 years for them to fathom, that Jesus will be the fulfillment of long waited for prophecies, that he will bring salvation to Jews and Gentiles. It's way too much to take in. In Luke's account of Jesus' presentation of the temple, he pulls out all of the stops and packs his story with narrative and theological significance. Simeon and Anna are telling us the end of Jesus' story at the very beginning, in a most powerful and dramatic manner. This story of Joseph and Mary taking their young baby into the temple 
to fulfill the law transcends time. It's as immediate to us as it was for the early church. We stand with the astonished parents at the wonder of what will occur in the unfolding life, ministry, death, and resurrection of this tiny child. May God's light shine on you too this epiphany season. Peace.